of the void notation, void notation. Of course, to be mathematically consistent, as a, we have used so far what is called the tensor, the, the scientific uh, tensor notation, in which the strains are a tensor, right? The strains are a tensor. Even if the decimal strains are considered a tensor, but we know that this is a symmetric tensor, OK? Symmetric tensor because this term is equal to that, that term is equal to that. And also, we can rewrite that in what is called the engineering notation, in which we have the infinitesimal elongations, uniaxial strains, and this is strange gamma xy, gamma xy, gamma yz, which are called angular strains. Anyway, so in, in practice, you know that these strains are defined in terms of just six numbers, epsilon x, epsilon y, epsilon z, gamma xy, gamma xz, and gamma yz. If I know those, I can reconstruct the tensor. So now, some engineer said y, instead of defining the strain tensor, I define the strain vector. I indicate it's a vector by putting a bracket in it, right? You have to dif differentiate what is a tensor and what is a vector here. Which is a vector of six components, epsilon x, epsilon y, epsilon z, gamma xy, gamma xz, gamma z. Of course, if I know this, I can reconstruct that just by placing every, every member at this proper time. Okay? What about the stresses? The stresses, again, normally, in elasticity, we are dealing with the Cauchy stresses, and the Cauchy stresses are a symmetric tensor. So they can be defined, again, in just six numbers. The three normal stresses and the three tangential stresses. Okay? which can be grouped in a vector instead of a tensor in terms of just the, sin the six numbers, which are the, the sigma, the, the vector of the. These are called the vector of strains and the vector of stresses in Boyle notation. They have a very interesting property, this notation, which is that whenever in any formulation the double contraction of sigma double contraction epsilon, so this tensor multiply by this tensor, right? Which means, by the way, multiply one by one every position and sum them up. So epsilon x plus sigma x plus epsilon y times, times y, or epsilon x times sigma x plus one half of gamma xy times tau xy plus one half of the same. So finally, you know that this term and this term and this term, these three terms provide epsilon x times sigma x plus gamma xy times tau xy. So anyway, the product sigma double dot epsilon is equal to the dot product, the vector product of these two vectors. How would I do you the, the double product of these two vectors? Just by multiplying the first times the first, plus the second times the second, plus the third times the third, plus gamma xy times tau, times tau xy, gamma xz times tau xz, gamma yz times tau times yz. If you do the check, you will see that the result is the same. If I use angular strains in the voice notation and the corresponding stresses in, in, the, in the stresses, then whenever I got this scalar, this is a scalar sigma double dot epsilon, it's the same that vector sigma dot epsilon. It's the same. Look, this appears many times, you know, we have seen that. For instance, in the stress power. You remember the stress power? Sigma times epsilon dot. We have seen a number of times. So, now, in practice, what will you find if you go to a finite element code? You will see that the stresses and the strains are not described in that way, are described in vector notation. And every time the theoretical issue, the, th the theory, says that you have to multiply the double dot product of stresses and a strain tensor, you will find that what they are done is just multiply this vector times this vector here. Okay? That is what constitutes the voids notation. How this affects also the elastic constitutive tensor. For instance, you know that the, for instance, if you look to the inverse constitutive equation, 
Epsilon, the strains and the stresses are related to a fourth order tensor, which I have plotted also here, right? Fourth order tensor, it depends. And by manipulation, it can be seen that the vector of strains and the vector of stresses are related to a now six times six matrix, which is called the constitutive matrix which turns out to be like one. So that is a matrix that you see it depends on the Young modulus and Poisson coefficients. So that the inverse constitutive equation can be now written in terms of vectors instead of tensors. So the vector of strains is this inverse constitutive uh, matrix C minus one times the vector of stresses, that vector of stresses. So that is why is six times six plus the thermal strains. Look, how do we obtain the thermal strains? This is epsilon x, epsilon y, epsilon z. According to that, they would be here. And here there will be the angular strains. But the thermal strains don't have any angular components. So the vector of thermal strains in Boyd's notation has these three terms here and zero the other. And that's what you will find if you try to implement an elasticity problem in a finite element. Using this inverse constitutive equation to express the Hooke's lock, the, Hooke's lock, the strains equal this matrix times the vector of stresses plus the thermal strength which is there. And of course, the opposite can be also done. What if that is the inverse, we can compute the, the direct matrix corresponding to that. That is what is called the C hot matrix, which is a six times heat six matrix, that obtain the vector stresses as the product of this elasticity matrix, elasticity matrix which corresponds to an isotropic linear elastic. Isotropic linear elastic, which is defined in terms of the Young modulus and the, the Poisson ratio and the thermal strain. Okay? So finally, with no change in the concept for practical purposes, you will find the same equations we have seen so far, now written instead of the tensor form in terms of the vector form using the void notation. Okay? Well, that is the end of the theoretical part of elasticity.